I'm deeply grateful to Rab Chaim Mintz and to the officers of URA for having invited me to come to speak to all of you. I would like to share with you a story that to me is so touching. And when it happened to me, right here in my home where I'm making this video, I was taken by such surprise because it just happened out of nowhere. I just want to share with you, it was the night of the Seder. It was the first Seder night. It was a number of years ago. And we were all sitting in the dining room having the Seder. I was here with my children and some of my grandchildren. And one of my grandchildren, a three-year-old named Avramala at that time, and uh, he was three at the time. And of course, he was also at the Seder. But as you can understand, the three-year-old is not really following. He sits at the table. He runs to the kitchen. He runs to the living room. He gets some toys. And the Seder goes on. And whatever part he can participate, you know, he's participating. But of course, the adults are there. And I'm leading the Seder. All of a sudden, we're about to come to the part of Vahisha Amda. Now, Vahisha Amda is a very, very happy part of the Seder, as you all know. Everybody holds up the kais, and we all sing Vahisha Amda together. And just as we're getting ready to sing Vahisha Amda, my little grandson comes over to me, and he says to me, Zaidi, can I sit on your lap? Well, I can tell you this. Mitzvah Hashem, all of you will be Zaidis and Bubbies or whatever. And when your grandson wants to sit on your lap by the Seder, of course, what's the question? So I picked up my kais in my right hand, and of course I had my grandson on my left lap, and we're getting ready to sing Vahisha Amda. And everybody is singing Vahisha Amda together, and all of a sudden, as I'm singing it, and I'm saying some of the words, I get so choked up that I, I just, tears came to my eyes, I couldn't sing anymore, and, and I, I started crying. And everybody's looking at me like, what is he crying? Like, you know, and it's so embarrassing because, you know, I'm the leader of the Seder, everybody's singing and looking at me, and I, I just, I'm just so overwhelmed. And the reason that I was so overwhelmed was because as I was holding my grandson, I said these words, and we all know these words. <speaking in Hebrew> Not only one nation is trying to get rid of us. <speaking> in every generation, they're trying to get rid of us. And I was thinking to myself, <speaking in Hebrew> doesn't it ever end? When does it stop? We lost six million. So many people in Eretz Yisrael are hurt in so many different ways. And the, the Yidden throughout the generations have been so persecuted. And now the Bala God is telling us it never ends. And I'm thinking, what's, what's in the future for my grandson? What's in the future for all the children his age? And I was so distraught by what the Bala God was telling us about the future of Kuala Yisrael and our, our relationship to the nations of the world that I, I just, I, I just, well, I was crying. Of course, I took hold of myself, and the Seder just wasn't the same. And at the end of the Seder, I went through every single Haggadah, and I just wanted to get some comfort. I, I just wanted to get some insight into these words. And finally, I found the Haggadah of the Chidah, Rav Chaim Yosef David Azaloy, a great Spanish Haggadah. And he writes, what does it mean, in every generation they're trying to get rid of us? We know that there's some generations, take a look like in America. You know, you can have Kinusim, you can have a Sima Shas of 70,000 people in total in different places, and, and, and you can have schools all over and uh, Kinusim and camps. You know, nobody's getting rid of us in America. What does that mean? And he gives a very great answer. And he says, sometimes it's the sword and sometimes it's the smile. In other words, sometimes, let's say like in Nazi Germany, the Nazis, Yimach Shemom, with a sword, they tried to get rid of Yidden. They killed them out in the concentration camps, killed them out in the streets. But sometimes, in certain generations, in certain places, it's because that we get along with the Goyim so well, and we have such a free society that Yidden fall by the wayside, and they become, unfortunately, involved with the Goyim, especially the non from Yidden. And then we lose so many, and we lose so many to assimilation. So... At least I had some nechama, I had some insight into what those words meant. Many of you know that I'm a male. So the first day Cholomite, I go out to Long Island, and I had a bris in a place called Mount Sinai, of all places. The father was not Jewish, the mother was a Jew, and the grandparents, of course, wanted to have a bris because the mother was a Jewish person, and the baby was Jewish. And right after, when I did the bris, I turned around, and I saw on the table the most unbelievable thing. I saw a box, a blue box of Horowitz Margaret and Matzis, and right next to the matzahs was a platter of bagels, right? Chametz and matzah. And then 
there was a cheese platter and there was a meat platter. Every single isser that you could think of, basa, b'chalov, chametz, and matzah, it's all there. And I was thinking, what does the Rabbi Nishtam say about a bris like this? What does the Leon Navi say about a bris like this? How in the world did this happen? And you know why it happened? It happened because of the smile. It happened because the mother, Jennifer, she could go to any college and she could go to any society and she could get a job in any place because today in America it's a free society. You can do almost anything. So the Goyim and the Yidin mix. And when you have that, you have a spiritual holocaust. And so therefore, if you think about it, what's going on in the world, today there are 13.3 million Yidin. Only 1.8 million are from. That means 86.5% of Yidin are not from. Four out of five. Could you imagine the pain of the Rabbi Shalom? Four out of five of his children are at risk. They're not from. And out of those four out of five, do you know that among the Yidin that are not from, there are one and a half million Yidin practicing other religions. How are we going to stop this? This is a tsunami of, of, of uh, I don't want to say upper courses, but it's a tsunami of terrible spiritual wasteland. And we're losing so many Yidin. And that's where Ura comes in. And you know why Ura comes in? Because Ura deals with the children. And then the children deal with the adults. And you know something? It's only with the children that we're going to be able to save Klal Yisrael. And I'll tell you how you know this. Because when Moshe Rabbeinu went to Pare, what did he say? With our children and our elders, we're going to go out of Mitzrayim. And he mentioned the children first. And the idea is that it's only through the children, when they come back to Yiddishkeit, and they are so firm in their beliefs, and in their Avas Yisrael, and in their Torah, and their mitzvahs, that it inspires the parents to come back. And that's exactly what it says in Malachi at the end of time. When Eliyahu Navi comes, the Pesach tells us, V'heshiv leiv ovais al bonim, v'leiv bonim al avoisam. V'heshiv leiv ovais, Dr. Rashi, ayidei bonim, through the children. And that's what Ura does. Ura has the camps, the zone camps for boys and for girls. And not only it inspires these kids, but it makes sure that they're going to go to yeshivas. And Ura pays so much money every year for the tuition of these boys and girls that are going to yeshivas that were not from at all. And I'm telling you, the sincerity of these kids is absolutely incredible. I'll tell you a little incident that happened in one of the Ura camps in the zone. It, it's just incredible. It's a little 11-year-old boy who's not from, came from a non-from family. Some, an Ura professional got a hold of him and tried to get him a tutor, and the tutor just began to teach him Aleph Beis in this kid's hometown, and they were able to get to Dalad. Aleph Beis, Gimel, Dalad, that's all the kid knew. And then he comes to the camp. He comes to the camp, and this kid, this 11-year-old boy, is so determined that he's going to learn the Aleph Beis that while other kids are playing sports, he's practicing his Aleph Beis, an 11-year-old kid, Hashem Tuchnet. He's not embarrassed. And finally... Not only was he able to learn the Aleph Beis, but he was able to learn how to read. That by the end of camp, he was going around telling the counselors, look what he can read. Could you imagine what an accomplishment that is? An 11-year-old boy is able to go from not even knowing the Aleph Beis to be able to read in just a few weeks. That's what the Ava, that's what the love, and that's what the dedication of the Ura counselors are. And it's not only that they have it in camp, but they follow up with these kids afterwards. And they make sure that they get into schools. And the Uru professionals follow them into the schools and make sure that they learn with them. And they have sh Matzah Shabbos programs, learning programs. And it's called Avais Sabanim. What kind of Avais? It's not Avais in a sense because these kids have no fathers that are from that they can teach them. But it's the Uru volunteers and the Uru professionals that are involved with these kids. I want to share with you a very interesting story that happened on a Shabbaton that Ura ran on Shabbos Hanukkah. They got together many, many children. Some of them had been in the camp, uh, the zone camp in the previous uh, summer, and some they picked up in different communities. And they had a wonderful Shabbos. There were hundreds of kids, and they all lit Hanukkah licht, and they all sang together. And it was just a wonderful, very upbeat, inspirational Shabbos. Now, Mata Shabbos, the Ura counselors, what they wanted to do, and this was organized by um, Rabbi Chaim Usher Reichman, who's the learning director, and they wanted to have what's called an Avi Sobonim program. The Avi Sobonim, as we said, is a program where fathers learn with their children, but over here, of course, the counselors of Ura would be learning with these kids. And the reason they did it very cleverly was because they wanted to show them that Mata Shabbos is a time for learning. 
It's not Saturday night, it's Matzah Shabbos. It's a time of holiness. It's a time of when you can become closer to Hashem as the Shabbos leaves. And so therefore, they had this wonderful learning program, and then as they have in all the other Sabanan programs throughout wherever they have them, they had a raffle. And this little boy wins the raffle, and... Um, it's some sort of a prize, whether it's a remote control car or some sort of an iPod or whatever, some expensive little gift. And there was one of the volunteers, a fellow Dovey Pines, who watched this kid walking back holding this gift. And the kid was not happy. You know, kid wins a raffle, everybody's so happy for him, the little boy should be happy, but he wasn't happy. And he goes over to um, this little boy and he says, uh, you don't look so happy, is, is everything okay? He says, I'll tell you the truth, I have this already in my home. He says, would you like another prize? He said, yeah, I really would like another prize. So Dovi certainly wasn't in his job, but he's a leif toif admiyoid. He's a wonderful person. So he takes this little boy and he brings him to Rabbi Reichman. And he says, Rabbi Reichman, this little boy has the prize already in his home. Is there any way that we can give him another prize so that he can go home feeling so special that he won the raffle and he goes home with something that's unique? Rabbi Rachman says, of course. Come to the room where we have all the prizes. They come into the room and there are many, many different toys there. But in the corner, there were chamashim, chamashim that they were going to use the next summer in camp. And they were all piled up because this was on the campgrounds in Jefferson, New York. And the little boy doesn't go to where the toys are. He goes to where the chamashim are. And he said, I would like to have one of those. And Rabbi Reichman says to him, well, of course, you could have one of those, but that was not one of the prizes that we were offering. It was one of the chumashim that we were going to take up to camp. And he says, no, but that's what's important to me. I don't have a chumash at home. And to me, that's more important. That would be the biggest prize. And all the counselors who heard this story were so touched by it because it showed what the Shabbos did and what Ura does for these little kids. And I'll tell you something, this story that I'm about to tell you is, is just adorable. I mean, it, it, it's almost ridiculous, but again, it just shows you the sincerity of the children. One of these little girls from, who was in the, in the zone camp, she comes to school, and now she's in a day school, but her parents are not kosher. And in this day school, which is a from school, they served pizza for lunch. And this little girl was not eating. So they asked her, why are you not eating? Everybody's eating lunch. And she says... I had fleshics this morning. I had meat this morning. I said, well, you had meat? She said, yeah, I had a ham sandwich. So the poor kid, she's eating tarfus in the house, but she remembers that she's got to wait six hours after meat. Now, of course, it's tragic, and it's almost funny, but the idea is you see the sincerity of a little child, even though that she's obviously eating what's treif, but she remembered the halacha of fleshics and milchiks and bosa b'cholov, and that's what Ura is doing. And, you know, I just want to mention to you the broad scope of, of what Ura is doing. If you would realize how many children are going to schools literally around the country. For example, you have in the Hebrew Academy in Miami, you have children that come from the Ura Zone camps. The Poland's Day School in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. The Yeshiva of Greater Washington in Silver Springs. In Bay Shandel in Lakewood. In the Kesha Institute of Yerushalayim. And in the Ateres Yisrael School of Rabbi Youngreis, the Ezra School here in Queens, and Rabbi Kishani's in Orachayim, you have such a wide range of schools where these Ur children go. And that's why I believe so much that we have to get involved, as I said, not only in our own personal Kirov, but in the Kirov together with Ura. So I want to tell you another great story, a story that happened in Tanakh about a certain king that most of you probably didn't even hear of, but it's so remarkable. This person lived in the time of the first Beis HaMikdash, and his name was Yeshiyahu. Now, I just want to tell you what it says about Yeshiyahu. In Molochim Beis, Perich of Gimel, Pasich Hafei. And it says like this, Komoyu lo'ihoyo lefon of Melech. There was never a king that returned to Hashem. B'chol avovoy, u'b'chol nafshay, u'b'chol ma'odoy. And obviously that's based on what it would say in Krishna. With his whole heart, his whole soul, all his talents, nobody ever return to Hashem like he did. And the Pasuk tells us, nobody's going to be like him. So listen to what happens. He's now the king in, this, in the first Beis HaMikdash, and it's hard to believe, but people stop going to the Beis HaMikdash. They stop davening there. They stop bringing Kabbanas there. And it bothered Yeshio like anything. And he decided he's going to make the people come back, and he's going to inspire them to bring them back. 
So slowly but surely, the Beit HaMikdash had fallen into disarray. You know what happens to a building when nobody comes there. You know, the ceiling begins to peel, the walls begin to crumble, the floor is buckling. And that's what was happening in the Beit HaMikdash. So he was putting away money. Him and the Kayin Gadol, Chilkiyo HaKayin, they were putting away money that they're going to refurbish the Beit HaMikdash when it comes time to really fix it up. And people are going to start coming back again. So one day he goes to Shof on his secretary and he says, go to the king, tell the king, tell the Kayin Gadol rather, Tell them that right now we're ready. People are coming back. We're going to refurbish the base of Migdash. So Shafan goes to Chilkiyo Akoyan and they open up the treasure chest and there's a Sefer Torah there. And the Sefer Torah is open to a Pasek. And when they read this Pasek, they are so frightened because the Pasek is part of the Toichacha. And the Pasek is in Dvarim Chav Zayin, Pasek Chavav. And it says like this, Oror, cursed is the one, Ashelo Yokim as Divrei HaTorah says. Cursed is the one who will not uphold this Torah. And they take it as a bad omen. This is what we see, cursed, that we're going to be cursed if we don't uphold the Torah. And they're so frightened. And they go back to Yeshio. And they say, Yeshio, dear king, look what happened. We're trying to get the money to build up the Beis HaMikdash again. And, and we open up the, uh, the treasure chest, the Sefer Torah is open, and that Pasek is, 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 is like a horrible message to us. And listen to what Yeshio does. He comes and he reads the Pasek. And he screams out two words that every single one of us has to scream out tonight. Every one of us has to say these two words. When he said, when he saw those words, Or Yokim, cursed is the one who is not going to uphold the Torah, he says, Olai Lahokim, I will uphold it. I will uphold it. I accept the challenge and I'm going to uphold it. And that's why he was the great king that he was. And listen to what the Yerushalmi says. What does it mean when he says, Olai Lahokim? And this is what Yerushalmi teaches us. Lomad, Valimed, if somebody taught and learned Vishoma and he observed and he was able to be Marzik other people, he was able to give encouragement to other people and he didn't give courage, encouragement to other people, such a person is Aru, such a person is cursed. That's Arash Allah in other words, Kirov is so important. It's not enough if you're a tzaddik. It's not enough if you're learning and you're davening. You've got to make sure that others are being machazik in their limit Torah and in their Yiddishkeit and in their mitzvahs. And if you can't do it, then you've got to help those people that are doing it. And Ura is doing it. And that's what we are making this video for because we want to encourage every person to get involved in the people in your neighborhood that are not there yet, that are not involved in frumkeit, that are not involved in mitzvahs, that are not involved in davening. And the least that we can do is to help Ura because they're doing it and they're doing it successfully. And when we have that opportunity, they are our shlichim. And that's what we have to learn tonight. We have to learn to make a commitment to Kirov in our own personal lives, to be makar as many as we can, and to make sure that we support such a great organization like Ura. So I just want to tell you one more thing, and with that we'll close. It was a great story that happened many, many years ago. It happened in Williamsburg. It was during the winter, and it was a terrible snowstorm. And there was a Rosh Hashiva, his name was Rav Shleimah Hyman. And Rav Shleimah Hyman was, unfortunately, he never had no children. And one of his Talmudim was Rav Moshe Samuels, who I remember Rav Moshe Samuels. He was a Rebbe in Terbidas many, many years later, but he told over the story that that day when there was that snowstorm in Williamsburg, there was only four boys in class. Everybody thought Rav Shleimah Hyman was not gonna teach new Gemara, because there's only four kids, a review will tell a story or something. He's not gonna learn new Gemara. But he got in so involved in the Gemara and he was teaching with such an excitement he had to stop for a minute just to get a glass of water. And as he was drinking the water, one of the Bochum said to him, Rebbe, like, take it easy. There's only four boys here. And listen to what he said. He said, you think I'm only talking to you? I'm talking to you and to your children and to your grandchildren. I'm talking to you and to your Talmudim and to your Talmudim's Talmudim. And Rabbi Moshe Samuels would say that later he would say, I became a Rebbe only because of my Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Shlomo Hyman. And Rabbi Moshe Samuels had hundreds, if not thousands, of Talmudim. So Rabbi Shlomo Hyman was right. He wasn't only talking to four boys. He was talking to 400 or 4,000 kids of all the Talmudim and all the children and grandchildren that would come from those four boys that were there. And that's the lesson that we have to learn. Every child that's saved, it's not only that child. It's his children, and it's his grandchildren, and sometimes it's even his parents. We've come here to talk to all of you, to become so serious about Kirov, 
Of course, we know this video has a lot of fun and games. It's a wonderful thing to watch. But you have to remember the seriousness of what Ura is all about. The camps, the schools, the tuitions, the dedications. And we thank Rabbi Chaim Mintz. Rabbi Chaim was the one who thought of this whole idea of Ura, and he's made it into a magnificent organization. David should, should help that all of us should be involved, not only in Kirov in our own lives, but Kirov together with Ura. So we should talk a live to see the day when the Leo Anabi comes to bring Mashiach, and we'll all be able to see how this puzzle comes to fruition. Thank you.